So I think that a lot of um, I think a lot of popular natural history likes to portray the animal kingdom in very human terms. And, and also, stories that are popular seem to be ones where animals are behaving like us. Um, they're providing us with some kind of reassurance in some way. Um, you know, animals on television, you know, tend to have um, nice nuclear family setups, uh, and uh, and, I, and I think that what's sort of fascinating to me is that this sort of desire to see animals behaving in a a, a nice moral uh, Christian family values even uh, way is something that we've been propagating for millennia. I mean, actually. Tra it, it can be traced all the way back to the, um, the beasties, the medieval beasties, which were the very first animal en encyclopedias, if you like. Um, and these books were written by religious scribes, and they all copied one book, which was called the Physiologus, which was uh, actually the naturalist is, is, is what that translated as. And that was written in the sort of fourth century. And what they, what these books, what the Physiologus did is it, it popularised uh, natural history and it took it to the masses and it became a massive bestseller. I think it was second only to the Bible, hugely popular. And it, but what, but what the Physiologus and the and the Beasteries did was to look for moral tales within animal behaviour. They weren't interested in trying to tell the truth about animals or enlighten their audience about animal behavior or, or even the, the, the animal kingdom. They wanted to use, they believed that God had implanted moral lessons in animals to teach us. And so the stories that they told about animals, which were hugely popular, were all very moral. They were animals were good or they were bad. Um, and they, they taught us lessons about what's sinful and what isn't. And I think that to a certain extent, we still do that today. We, we are still peddling these same myths to a very large extent. Um, you know, uh, popular press and newspapers, they love to tell stories about how, you know, there was something the other day that went viral about a stork that was re returning to its partner after many years and showing this, 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 this love affair. And we, we, we love to see these sort of heroic or, or, or very kind of Christian stories being told in um, in popular popular zoological stories in the papers or, or even um, on television. I think the risk of anthropomorphizing animals in this way is that we just will fail to understand them. We won't appreciate them on their own terms for what they are. To paint the animal kingdom with a with a Christian moral brush is to deny it in its, all of its sort of sibling eating, um, you know, blood sucking, corpse shagging glory, you know. And, and the thing is, is we, we, we shouldn't be afraid of animals to behave as they do in these uh, ways that are, are maybe even morally repugnant to us. They're not there to teach us a lesson. They're just there to live their lives. If we want moral guidance, we should be looking inside of ourselves for that. We shouldn't be looking to a penguin, for example, to tell us how to teach our lives. Now, but you're probably thinking, oh, penguins are really cute and they're monogamous and they mate for life. Well, actually, um, that's not true either. Penguins are birds with small brains that live in a very brutal environment. They have a short window in which to reproduce and so they're flooded with hormones and the males particularly in the Adelie penguin which is your, your classic little black and white penguin the males are pumped full of hormones and so they'll basically have sex with anything that moves and quite a few things that don't move like dead penguins so uh, <laughs> penguins uh, nefarious sexual activity was first discovered by a member of Scott's Antarctic uh, team and he was 
so horrified by what he saw that he encoded his observations of penguin sexual behavior in Greek in his notebook lest they fell into the wrong hands and then he and his the diaries are absolutely hilarious to read because he starts off and he's there observing the penguins and he's like oh look at them they're so lovely they're like little children they're so cute and then after after a few days with them he starts writing about how there are gangs of hooligan cocks whose passions seem to have gone beyond their control and who are who are abusing chicks before the eyes of their parents you know and this sort of you know thoroughly appalling sexual behavior that's that's taking place but of course this is this is just penguins being penguins they you know they have this very short window in which to breed it just makes sense that they they're flooded with hormones and and they they're programmed to to have you know fairly indiscriminate sex so you know, it, it's not for us to, to make moral judgments about. But um, so, uh, uh, so yes, so uh, penguins are, um, uh, yeah, yeah, what's interesting about when, when Levick came back from the Antarctic with his observations on penguins, he took them to the Natural History Museum in England, who published the first sort of definitive book about um, penguin behaviour, but they refused to publish their sexual behaviour. That chapter was not included and instead it was printed up as a separate document um, and circulated amongst a few learned people who were able to, to cope with this and, um, and stamped not for publication and lost to science for a hundred years. Because we don't want penguins to behave like that. We want penguins to be cuddly, fluffy, lovely, monogamous, sweet little animals but uh, they're not. Mm -hmm.